Well, maybe we should get this uh, program started, and uh, we have a long afternoon and there are many things. And uh, so let me just first uh, welcome you all to come to this uh, panel discussion on entrepreneurship, enterprise, and technology in modern China. We have uh, three distinguished alums coming back to, to share the story with us. And Drew Mason, class of 89, Allison Friedman, class of 02, and uh, John Chen, class of 78. And uh, this particular panel discussion is co-sponsored by U of China and also CV Star Program for Commerce Organization and Entrepreneurship. And uh, uh, let me just mention that, as I said, we have a long program this afternoon, uh, between now, about, for about an hour. We have the, this panel discussion, then we have a break. And at 4 o'clock, uh, John uh, is going to give a talk on um, mutual reassurances. Mutual reassurance, how to steer U.S.-China relations towards a new golden age. Okay, so let me just uh, uh, perhaps uh, get this uh, program started. Uh, each one will speak about, give a short talk about 10 minutes or so. Then we're going to open up to the series to an uh, informal discussion and Q&A and uh, make it uh, uh, interesting, I'm sure. So let me start with uh, Drew. As I said, Drew is a class of uh, 89. He's a co-founder and a managing partner of Jade Capital Management, a leading provider of venture and growth capital for top entrepreneurs in China's financial services sector. Uh, Mr. Mason also is also one of the founding member of Soho.com, one, uh, one of the first Chinese companies to be listed on NASA, and the China Risk Finance LLC, which is China's leading consumer finance solutions provider, voted Private Equity International's Venture Capital Deal of the Year in 2007. He was formerly the head of investment banking for the technology sector of Asian Pacific for UBS Warper, where he worked on Asian M&A deal of the year for 1999 to 2001. He also has a very interesting background before getting into this area. He was oper operating experience, his operating experience includes, ser includes serving as an intelligence officer during the Operation Desert Storm for USS Abraham Lincoln. And I understand he also was one of the funding members of the Naval College, War College involving a component of that. More importantly, I think Drew told me that they have a family tradition of service, which is a very uh, distinguished member for the continue the family tradition in service for the country. He's, uh, he's on the board of China Risk Finance Shanghai Harvest Network and a member, most importantly, a member of President Brown's China Council. And he's uh, got a BA degree from Brown in history, which led naturally into this particular line of work. <laughs> and uh, also, well, okay, he did some, get a math MBA from Harvard Business School. <laughs> okay, well, he worked for New York, London, and Hong Kong, and uh, currently resides, resides in Larchmont, New York. So let's welcome Drew to get the program started. Great, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for sharing your afternoon with us today. It's very exciting to be back at Brown and to talk about a subject close to my heart, entrepreneurship, in particular China. You know, one of the interesting questions that students ask over the last couple of days is, well, when you were Brown, was there some plan or how did you get involved with China? Is this something that you thought you'd always do? And I think it's just interesting that uh, it's really the way I would describe it is a series of fortuitous accidents. But if there was a theme to it, I think Brown did give a sense of conviction about your own independent ideas. 
And I think that definitely was part of it because I think, um, although I may not be the logical person to have been doing so much in China, uh, early on I was willing to get involved when no one else was. And there were some reasons why, which I'll tell you about. You know, looking back, I could probably put a neat wrapper on it, which would say I've always been interested, even as a history student, in what I would call, has a fancy name, but you know, information asymmetries. <laughs> you know, the idea that I might know something and more about it than you do. And in a way, I always thought that was extremely interesting in history. If you want to write a good paper and get some attention, you need to find something out that someone else hadn't thought about. So that always intrigued me. Uh, we do have a family uh, tradition, and at first, my first real direct exposure uh, to Asia. It took me a while to move my way to China, but was I did uh, as a sophomore at Brown. I did get a scholarship for the U.S. Foreign Affairs Committee chairman to be an exchange student to South Korea, and I spent the summer there. And interestingly, only later could I connect the dots. I think Steve Jobs talks about this. Only afterwards can you really connect them. But Korea does have a heavy Confucian influence, a heavy influence from China, and somehow that resonated with me. There was something intriguing, something that fascinated me. Also, the uh, I'd say the reverence that people have for education, which I, I you know appreciated that. Uh, we do have a family tradition to uh, do some public service. You know, we my family we think uh, spending some time in the military is public service. So. I uh, served as an intelligence officer aboard the Abraham Lincoln, and uh, we didn't expect there would be the first Gulf War, but that's where I first went. And I think there also, as an intelligence officer, my job again, you know, information asymmetries. You know, are there, is there that needle in the haystack uh, that would be valuable to that pilot, you know, as he flies that mission, you know, et cetera. So that's something, a theme uh, that interested me. Um, and finally, now I'm getting closer to Asia, the banking. Along the way, um, when I went straight from the ship to Harvard Business School, uh, the very early days, they had really not done much with China at Harvard at the time in business. So they needed someone to talk about China. My father had done something in Hangzhou, built a small power plant. The reason I'm telling you this story, this is really when I started to get involved in China. A young entrepreneur happens to have a PhD in physics, so there's some physicists in the room. Uh, his name is Charles Zhang, and uh, he, he snuck into this discussion you know, at, at Harvard, and he went up to my father afterwards, and he said, I have this business plan. It's a really interesting idea. I want to bring the internet to China. And my father said, well, I'm, you know, internet, where? Okay, well, I'm a little busy, but maybe my son, maybe he might help you. But what I learned is there was something so unusual about this individual. And later I would learn top of the national exam system, handpicked by the Chinese government to study here. Went to the same schools we did, but did hard things like PhDs in physics. So I decided to help him more, again, going back to asymmetry, I think now in China what it's really long-term attracted me is what I would call human capital arbitrage, where you have these incredible, talented people that, that have a reverence for education, et cetera, but may not have had some of the same opportunities we did. And so I helped him write his business plan. I, then I, uh, I said, look, I, I, I want to do it now. I said, well, Charles, you have no business experience. So I helped him find his first job. Uh, then he wanted to go to China. I actually found a classmate who needed to open a Beijing office. He did that. Meanwhile, I was going on with my career in London covering Asia, uh, not quite yet China. But Charles, this big company really started to grow. And interestingly, when I was along the way, again, fortuitous accident, I was in a meeting once for in UBS Warburg, and someone said, we just got this phone call because we merged with uh, Swiss Bank. And in Jakarta, Indonesia, there's uh, someone, a golfing buddy of President Suharto uh, has got a business deal. Does anyone, anyone here you know, want to go check it out? I don't know, I was 25 or something, I put my hand up, sure, I'll go. Before I knew it, I was the Asia coverage officer, you know, going out to Asia regularly, mainly Southeast Asia. And then around the financial crisis, that was kind of the crossover point. Now I really got involved with China because Southeast Asia slowed down, Sohu was about to go public. And then my firm, uh, somehow they knew I had something to do with it. So they called, said, you can help us get the IPO. And so I had to convince people in London that they should allow me to fly to Beijing to try. And for a while, uh, we were quite involved uh, with it, and eventually they did go public. But then, kind of another fortuitous accident, someone I'd worked with called me in the room, a senior, very senior person at the bank who I didn't really know that well. Uh, and he said, Drew, uh, it's clear you know something about financing technology companies. I knew a little bit, because I'd helped Sohu find the first money. And you helped us get this IPO, and we've got all these people in Asia, that, in China, that they want, they want someone to do more coverage of technology. Would, would you like to be the head of technology investment banking for Asia Pacific? And I just had moved my 
now wife, then fiance to London with her career. So you won't believe this. We were supposed to stay here three years, but I really want to do this. Do you mind? And she was very supportive. But anyway, that, um, I'd say that's how one step led to the other. It was always trying to find a little edge on an information asymmetry, something that I could know more about that people older than me maybe didn't know, and that would then give me the opportunity to have leadership you know, earlier. And the last thing I'll say, so that's how I got involved with China. Uh, you know, what is the pattern that I've found? And there are many ways to be successful in, in China, and you'll, John and others, you'll hear Allison, you know, their experiences. But what I've found, uh, and this is going to be a little more, now I'm shifting gears a little bit, a little more technical, but for investing in China, China is arguably the most policy-led economy in the world. So they have five-year plans. They'll continue to have five-year plans as long as the power, you know, parties in power. It is incredibly important understanding the economic landscape uh, in China. The second thing is, no matter what sector you're in, the government's your partner. I would argue that's true the world over. But it's just a question of degree. But in China, it's absolutely a partner. Who would think that milk would become you know, such a major issue? You, know, you might people might have thought it's safe over in consumer. In my view, government's always your partner. So what we found a commonality of entrepreneurs that we like working with, anything they do, first of all, has to be in alignment with the government policy objectives. And some might say, well, how do you figure that out? It's actually pretty easy. The government will tell you. Just read the five-year plan or you know, read the uh, China Daily. They'll give you a very good sense of what the policy objectives are. You don't have to guess. Uh, why is that important? It's important because the regulatory regime, remember policy-led economy, highly regulated, uh, it's never quite clear and it migrates because it's an economy that's growing so quickly. So when you form your business, you will not have, very likely, you will not have a clear regulatory framework the day you start your business. So if you're not doing something that's in alignment with the government policy objective, I think you're going to have a really hard time. But if you are doing something in alignment with the government policy objective, even if the regulation moves back and forth, if you're nimble and flexible, uh, you'll be able to have room to maneuver and to grow and survive. Uh, two more steps. You do need to have a big market that you're going after, and that's kind of the obvious thing in China. Everyone a lot of makes a mistake. Well, it's a big market, so of course, uh, you know, I'll be able to find uh, something that I can do there. But you need to look for, particularly if you're a Western investor, I think you need to find some type of market failure that it's, the government wants this problem solved, but somehow it's not being solved, so that there's a real value-add rationale for Western capital or technology to be involved. If it's me too, I think it's going to be difficult. And then the last layer that I would say is highly, this is the really hard part. So you get all that right. <laughs> And you know what your core competencies are, that's the other thing. You know, so let's say we're bringing technology or we're bringing good service or we're bringing, uh, you know, we're really good at these sets of things. Now the hard part, and it's extremely hard, you have to localize this. You have to make all of this work within the government policy framework, within the regulatory framework, and it has to be something that the market wants. That localization layer is extremely difficult. So the thing that we found, the commonality in all the entrepreneurs that we work with, and first of all, they all have challenges and their setbacks and their regulatory changes you don't expect. But the commonality of all of them is they have a great CEO, someone that really is able to interact with government, policy, regulatory, but also can be this bridge between whatever their core competency is, let's say it's technology, let's say it's service, and they can integrate all those things and constantly iterate it because you have to move with the market. So this is very complicated. So I'd say the hardest thing that we find investing in China is that, going back to that thing, the human capital. You know, finding the person that can really do this. Because you need also a team around all this. So now going back to the CEO, doing all these functions, you need to have a team. Management talent is still in very scarce supply in China because with such a fast-growing economy, people compete ruthlessly for managerial talent. So then you've got to have a CEO that can keep that ship together. And then the last layer, and then that's my final point, is you actually have to wrap the whole thing around governance, some type of shareholding structure uh, that will support this. Because one thing I've found over the last 15 years, and it'd be interesting to hear John and Allison's perspective, but I don't think it's changed very much, that Western investors, and this is kind of the shocking part, even 15 years later, the United States has massively underallocated China. China is massively underallocated the US. We don't really know a lot about one another from an investment standpoint. It's still early. 
if you look at asset allocations and endowments, et cetera, and what their percentage allocation to China, China's 10% of global market cap, but they might have a point and a half exposure. So what you find is most investors don't really understand China that well. They don't have local based research. I'm generalizing. But what ends up happening is investors overreact to problems, underreact to facts on the ground. So go back to that poor CEO. You're doing that triangle of all these things he's got to hold together. He's also got to keep those shareholders behind him, understanding what he's doing and supporting him or her, even though those shareholders may not have a really strong local network in China. So you really do need uh, someone of a genius you know, to be a great CEO, in, I think, in China. Uh, it, that's been our experience, that the ones we work really are tremendously talented people. And I felt so fortunate you know, to have a chance to work with some of them. And I'm really pleased to be here today to share those ideas with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> now, the next speaker is Alison Friedman. She's a class of 2002. It just seemed to be yesterday. So are you sure it's been out, out for a while? <laughs> anyway, uh, she's a choreographer, accomplished dancer, and the founder of Ping Pong Productions, is, which is a company focused on cultural exchange between China and the West. Maybe we'll uh, just say a few things about her background. Uh, Addison first was a international director of the Beijing Modern Dance Company before she was hired by Oscar-winning composer Tan Dong to be the general manager of his company, Parnassus Productions. She came to Beijing on a Fulbright Fellowship to research on the development of modern dance in China, in addition to lecturing on modern dance in both China and abroad. She has conducted research for Royal Netherlands Embassy, the Asian Cultural Council, and her writing has peer, appeared in Dance Magazine. She has worked as consultant for U.S. Embassy in China, also for Columbia University, for various dance theater, as well as other overseas dance companies. She <coughs> oversees various touring company to Middle East, China, and from 20, 2003 and 2005, she hosts a live music program on China Radio International, which is China's largest government-run radio station. Well, she has a lot of other credentials, but uh, I'll make this short. And uh, she uh, graduated from Brown, Phi Beta Kappa, Macum Laude, and she studied Chinese literature and uh, literary translation. She was a 2009 and 10 Art Management Fellow at the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts in Washington, and uh, a 2011 ISPA Fellow. And most importantly, she was in the news recently, and somebody, many people emailed me and said, is this somebody you have heard of? She was in New York Times, something to do with uh, top secret battle for the Pentagon Perifer. She apparently was instrumental in bringing the, this performance to China and uh, went through smoothly, quietly, till the last day, the perform or last performance in Beijing, somehow the government caught up with her. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the story she'll be telling us. Okay, let's welcome Alison. Thank you. <laughs> Should I stand up there? Should I sit here? Wherever? I'll sit here. I like having a feel like I'm at a meal or something. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cheng Yi and the Year of China, for bringing me here. This is the first time I've been back on campus since 2002, so it's a fabulous walk down memory lane. I can't believe how new and clean everything looks. The, the dining halls and used to be so not this new and clean. Um, I went to China in 2002 on a Fulbright Fellowship and did not plan to be there for 10 years uh, and counting. Like uh, Drew said, the many uh, 
fortuitous accidents led this way. I studied Chinese. I grew up in Washington, D.C., and I actually started Chinese in D.C. Uh, at a high school that, at, back in those days, was one of the early ones to have Chinese language. I was just interested in the language and the culture. I didn't know what I would ever do with it. And I got to Brown, continued with the language. At that time, all my classmates were business and econ majors, envisioning themselves in venture capital in this new market. And I thought, I like to dance. What am I doing learning Chinese? Um, so I went to Beijing in 2001 to intern at CNN's Beijing Bureau, thinking I'd maybe go the journalism route. And while I was there, I met a performing arts company and ended up performing with them that summer. And that's what blew it open for me, that I could combine these schizophrenic halves of my life, the performance and, and the China studies. So that was the inspiration to apply for the Fulbright to go back after graduation. Um, though the, in terms of, as you say, looking back and connecting the dots of what has linked the various things I've done over my life, both academically and professionally, the, the link that's been there is how um, to connect cultures and countries. And my method for connecting them has been the performing arts. My The motto of our company is uh, bringing China and the world together through the performing arts. And again, it goes back to that summer internship at CNN. I was performing at, um, I went in as a good Brown student, very ready to be so cynical and skeptical of CNN. Oh, it's the American media you know, conglomerate trying to paint China in a bad light. And, and I was ready to go in and be there and kind of go to head to head with my boss on the summer internship. And I was really heartened by the integrity of the journalist, you know, Jimmy Floor Cruz, who had been in China for um, decades and just his uh, his experience there. And the, the journalists were really truly trying to tell um, objective stories. And then me working that summer with this group called the Living Dance Studio, as cliched as it sounds, it was the first time I felt like I'd found family in China because we had this shared culture of modern dance. Uh, when we were there in the studio, you know, my language still wasn't quite up to snuff. Um, and even though I'd done the study abroad programs that Brown provides, I'd always felt like a foreigner in China. And that was the first time I didn't feel like a foreigner was during those rehearsals. And so that very viscerally brought home the power of the arts to bring people together. However, I've never believed that old saw that music is a universal language, dance is a universal language. I disagree. I think like spoken languages, the performing arts have their own cultural and historic background. And if you don't understand that, you won't understand the languages. So um, after the Fulbright, I, I stayed. I had different jobs. I worked with different arts organizations, some of whom uh, Chengyi mentioned, Professor Tan mentioned. and. I had a lot of side projects, so I was doing a, a lot of American and European organizations were coming to China and having a lot of problems. They were encountering um, just different ways of doing business there, different ways of performing, you know, performing arts. The, the market there was quite different, and so very often I started to get hired to help smooth out some of those transitions. I, I often used to joke that I was always the firefighter brought in to put out these fires when people were having um, problems with, with their local Chinese partners. And so I saw that there was this need for those kinds of cultural translators. Um, and then I also, as over the last 10 years, as over the last 20 years, the, the meteoric um, involvement of the rest of the world with China, uh, I saw the greater importance of having the need for these bridges and what the kind of role that the performing arts can do. And I hear a lot of criticism of, well, American culture is everywhere. We don't need to send more out. You know, we, get, we all get the movies. We get the television shows. We can buy Nike in China now. We have Starbucks on every corner. And that is all true, but that's one side of it. And so what the arts can do is that they show another side or additional sides of things. And, uh, and what is so key uh, for cultural diplomacy, for con company, or con cultures, companies, countries interacting, is to be able to hold in your mind a multifaceted, diverse image of, a, of the other. And what happens when, on the China side, OK, they've got the commercial a access to America. They've got the commercial access to products and, and things. But that doesn't tell the whole story of such a rich and diverse country and society of America. And vice versa on the flip side. Yes, every day in the paper now we have plenty of articles about China. Well, what are they about? Pollution, human rights issues, meteoric economic rise. Are all of those you know, legitimate aspects to report on? Yes, but they tend to become one-sided. So what else is out there to show additional stories, additional sides of this unbelievably ancient, rich, and diverse culture and country. And so um, this, this was the, the drive and the inspiration for setting up Ping Pong Productions, uh, which actually today is our two-year anniversary um, from when it was officially registered in the US. The, um, 
Our mission is cultural diplomacy. The project that you mentioned is a great example of what we do. It was a docudrama by LA Theater Works, which is a theater company out of Los Angeles. And when the woman first approached me to tour the company in China, I sort of thought, well, what's the interest of doing a historic docudrama in China? No one's really going to care. And then I realized it was a perfect, when I read the play, I realized it wasn't a uh, pro First Amendment play. There were no good guys and bad guys. It wasn't black and white. It Through the performance, it showed just just how complex those issues were of a free, an independent press and a, or independent judiciary and freedom of the press. It showed just how messy and convoluted it was, and that is the ki- those are the kinds of projects that my company is interested in doing. We're not a commercial booking agency. We don't bring pop stars or dance companies just to tour and leave. Um, there are more and more commercial agencies doing that in China now. They're great. Um, they're starting to make money. Not really. That's because there's still problems. Um, but what we're looking to do is not just sort of commercial one-offs of an exchange of product by touring shows. We're looking for productions that can show unexpected or unknown sides of different cultures. So the Pentagon Papers was ter- terrific because uh, we did post-performance discussions with lawyers and journalists. We did a lot of work with the Fudan School of Journalism and the Peking University Law School and just talking about the different issues and bringing up topics and it was amazing. We had one woman stand up after the first performance in Shanghai and she's Aust- she's Chinese but she's going to law school in Australia and she said, I learned more about the American court system in the last 80 minutes than all of the legal briefs I've read over the last two years and just things like that about the power of show don't tell and what you can see in just an 80 minute art piece and the kinds of conversations that you can initiate um, are what what keep me going with this project um, ironically the the we did get tremendous coverage there's New York Times LA Times a lot of great coverage but ironically the one thing that it covered was the one post performance discussion that was canceled and even though you know I know the journalist I know Andy who wrote the Times article is a good friend he, he's a good guy and, and is not out to kind of st- tell the same old hackneyed, you know, China cracking down on, on the freedom of the speech story. But the, the, the headline, I mean, he also knew that he wasn't going to just be able to tell the happy story that we, the Peking University Law School, the dean of the law school at Peking University had over 200 of his students there talking about issues of freedom of the press and an independent judiciary and who has the responsibility to publish or not to publish. And we had these unbelievable discussions. That was the positive story, but the New York Times published the one negative thing that happened. And I think it's sort of ironic that that's still what we're getting. Um, so that's that's where we are now. It's, uh, it's fabulous to be here and I look forward to your questions. So thank you. Thanks, Allison. Okay, the next uh, speaker is uh, Zhang Chen, the class of 1978, and also parents of class of 2006 and uh, 11. Okay. Zhang has served as the chairman, chief CEO, and president of Sybase since 1998. Under his leadership, Sybase has become the recognized indus- industry leader in enterprise mobility infrastructure. In addition, the company has significantly strengthened its position in data management, has has a long track record of increasing revenue and profitability, which is not easy these days. In acknowledging his business business leadership, Forbes magazine named Mr. Uh, Jiang Chen one of the top 25 notable Chinese American in business. He was named in 2007 Ernest and Young Entrepreneur of the Year in Northern California. In addition to business, Mr. Uh, Zhang is actively involved in international relations. He has testified before the Congress on U.S.-China trade relations. In 2005, President George Bush appointed him to serve on the President's Export Council. In 2006, he was appointed co-chair of the Secure Border and Open Door Advisory Committee. In addition, he has been a longtime member of the Committee of 100, currently serves as his chair, which is one of the most important uh, committee of uh, Chinese American in this this country. In recognition of his leadership in building U.S.-China relations, he received awards from U.S. Asian Institute in 2009, California Asian Business Council in 2007. He's uh, served on the board of director for Walt Disney Company, Wells Fargo Company, and many others. 
He graduated from Brown, as I say, in 1978, in engineering, making a commonality. It was a degree in electrical engineering. He held a master's degree from Caltech. He's honorary professor from Shanghai University. And, uh, And many others, and I'm not going to list that. There's too many to list. <laughs> he's, uh, more importantly, very active in the community, and he's a uh, trustee of Caltech. He was also uh, served on the board, I don't know what it's called, board of director of Watson, or and currently... Um, yeah, I was the emeritus. I was one of the early... Mm -hmm. Early uh, overseer, overseer of Watson uh, Institute, and uh, and currently also serving on the president's China Council, and we we'll welcome him back to come to Brown, and uh, will be here tell us something about Thank you. his experience. Thank you. Um, I uh, I came to Brown quite often. I mean, I have been coming to Brown in the last eight, nine, ten years, a lot more often. Partly because I got two girls who graduated from here, and. Um, you know, I have to get them to school and then make sure they <laughs> come here and the uh, graduation ceremony. In addition to that, um, I was very early um, quite involved with Watson when the building is brand new. Um, this is now quite a bit older. Um, and, um, and a number of, of, of things I, you know, spoke at as a guest speaker for Engine 9 a number of times, uh, you know. You know, every time I have my girls here, then I could I could have an excuse to come back in. So that was always very nice. So, um, of course, I know Ruth well and and, and so forth. Um, you know, my my involvement with uh, China is a little more obvious and straightforward uh, as compared to uh, uh, you know uh, Alison or Drew because uh, I'm Chinese um, and um, I'm. I was born in Hong Kong, graduated from Hong Kong. I graduated in high school there, and I came over here in this country to study. And I stayed here ever since. So that, that's a pretty straightforward thing. Uh, the other part is I'm a business driver. Um, I'm in technology, in high, high tech. Roughly about 70% of all high technology companies, whether you're in hardware, or in software, or in networking, or in semiconductors, of this country, about 70% is overseas, outside of the United States. Used to be 30% of that is from Europe, and the rest are kind of the rest. You know, the 40, you know, the rest is not small. Obviously, 40% you know is spread around uh, you know some part of the Asia business and you know uh, Japan and, and uh, um, South America and so forth. So, um, but lately in the last five years, the China rise have forced us every company that has to have some kind of involvement and, and operation over there. We don't have enough time today to talk about it, but that presents itself a big list of problems. Um, United States technology export licenses is not as straightforward as you think, obviously. Um, and and you know, and then and then we got very very tangled up with U.S. China relations. Um, and the reason is when this, the relationship is up, our business are a lot smoother. When the relationship is down, our business are a lot tougher. And there's also undercurrents around it. And you kind of mentioned a little bit about that. Um, you know, it's not only because of policy driven. You know, in the policy side of the world in China, if you want to be an entrepreneur over there, you just need to remember one very simple thing. Nothing in China as related to policy happened accidentally. Nothing. Okay? And they would probably predict 10 years from today what in the world is going to happen. Um, and, and you just have to, so therefore following policy is it's a very important thing. Shaping is very important. And then China is changing rapidly. Um, and I, I, I was fortunate, um, I went to, uh, to uh, hosted luncheon with um, the next, pres oh, next president of China, right? Uh, Xi Jinping in DC. That's why I just came in from DC this morning. Um, and Xi Jinping's visit, um, you know, we obviously listened to uh, uh, Vice President Biden talk and and listened to uh, Secretary Clinton and and, and 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 a whole host of other things. And she, obviously, Vice President Xi had made some comments. And you could you could look up, you know, go, you could Google it or Yahoo it. And there, you know, a lot of people have written a lot of things about it. You know, we could chat a little bit later if you would like to. Um, well, some of the areas or directions of this, but point is, um, if you want to be an entrepreneur over there, uh, which is ex especially in technology, 
I can only speak to technology, I'm not well versed in the area. So um, it's absolutely a great opportunity. However, there are a lot of issues that one needs to follow closely. You actually cannot change a lot of those. Okay? It's industry, its society has to change to accommodate what you will feel comfortable with in a more transparent manner and in the United States, in the Western world of doing things, uh, a Western way of doing things. And, and, but I could also assure you things because the needs of the Chinese, things are going to get better and better. Uh, it might take a little longer. And, and I'll give you an example. You know, there's always this whole complaint about intellectual properties. Um, and it's true. And it's absolutely true. And um, you know, my, my, my good friend, Steve Ballmer, Microsoft, every time he and I, I just met him last week. And he always say to me, you know, he actually introduced me to it. Like we, you know, we're in, the, in, a, in, a, in a, a charity event. His wife was there. Um, and my wife was there. So we were all, you know, we introduced each other and, and we never met each other's wife before. And, uh, and when he introduced me, he said, oh yeah, yeah, this is John Chan, you know, this IBM CEO. And this is also the guy who um, has big problem in how I treat uh, the Chinese. <laughs> and I, my wife kind of looking at me. My wife always looks at me, you know, she's, <laughs> you know, she always That's thinks that. <laughs> yeah, my wife thinks I'm, you know, as much as I advise the White House, she actually thinks I'm an idiot. Um, and so, um, so anyway, um, moving right along. Uh, the, so the, the reason is, you know, in the, in the technology world, addressing the policy issue of China on, in terms of intellectual property theft, uh, you have two ways to do it. One, you could embargo it and you could hit, hit them right in between the eyes with their, what their words were. Uh, or the other one is, I, I, and I chose to use a much more softer approach, and I will explain to you why that's okay. Okay, obviously number one, the easiest thing that everybody said is, well, Chinese know this is good for them. Absolutely, Chinese know it's good for them. So they're gonna, they're gonna move towards that anyway. So the question we should have is how do we hasten that, help them move to it, shape the choices that they make? Because it has to come from them. It can come from us. This is a very, you know, so this, this is a more of a constructive policy. So why would I get involved all the time? You know, why am I at the expert council and all that? You know, not that because my shareholder thinks I need more things to do. It's because I think this helps to shape a more constructive relationship going forward. In the last 10, 15 years, it indeed had shaped. And it's like a stock market. It went up, it went down, relationship goes sideways. You know, we erroneously bombed uh, you know, one embassy in Europe. And then, you know, and then so all of a sudden there's a spike plane that you know unfortunate accident uh, that that happened you know over the uh, you know the South China Seas uh, now we have coded areas of the South China Sea somebody fights over an island with the Japanese I mean all these things always happened and but but you know we, we don't spend time in focusing on helping the policy and shaping the policy um, it could it, it could have a have a have a way to spin out control um, uh, I mean, there's a lot to talk about, but, but th this is one that, that I would think that, you know, as Brown student, which are very different, by the way. Um, when I came to Brown, I'm the oldest. Okay. When I came to Brown, we're a lot more practical. We're trying to figure out how to be an engineer so that we can make a living. I mean, we're not idealists like my two, uh, you know, uh, distinguished panelists. Um, you know, and, and now I understand why my, my daughters always thought me, because I think somewhere along the line, Brown had changed to be more idealistic, uh, and, you know, about fighting the CNN boss and all that. You're right. The establishment are bad people. Well, in those days, we just want to be part of the establishment. You know, uh, we were hoping that we get hired to be part of the establishment. And, and, and um, but it is uh, but the, the good thing about the Brown education is, is about this thing is I really encourage people to get involved. Whether you get involved on the Chinese side or get involved on the U.S. side, you really do need to get involved. It's it's really I mean I I have to tell you it took me a while to cross that bridge. Um, when I first came, like every foreign student, I don't know how many of you are foreign students. Uh, Every, every foreign student, my dad and mom said, you have got to get good grades, okay? You have to graduate with, with some kind of honor so that we have honors, 
uh, and um, you know you, you got to do well because it's a it's a world out there. You know you need to have a good professional job, and so forth. So my parents from Shanghai refugeed. Um, you know before the curtain came down, escaped to Hong Kong, and you know my father has a accountant degree, uh, but it's Chinese. So it was not recognized by the British who was ruling in Hong Kong at the time. So it was a very difficult time going through, you know, and got better over time. But so they all think that you have to be a professional, you got engineers or doctors or, or whatever. You know, somehow you got to have a good living. Um, and, and, and those are my, my, so when I was going through this process, studying, I never really wanted to spend any time. I, I thought, you know, studying history, getting involved with the, the community, the society, or trying to even follow what's happening around the world. Well, first of all, those days not that easy um, because there's no internet and, and all that stuff. But, um, uh, it, it's just a kind of rock away time you could spend on the books. And, and so mm -hmm. we're just straight in doing this thing. Um, and, and, and then I now realize, after all these years, I realized that two things has actually happened. Number one, in order to be useful and to be successful, you actually have to get involved um, and to shape the, or help shape the environment, however daunting the task it may be. Because it, you know, if, nobody, if everybody doesn't do it, then we is no point of us complaining. This is a very simple thing. Being ethnic Chinese is another aspect of it, because in the United States, I speak a lot to university and colleges and students, especially the Asian community um, students there. Uh, you know, the easiest thought that comes to our mind is when we have some failure, it's always about discriminations of some sorts, and we're not being recognized and all that. Well, that might be true, right? Or, we, or glass ceiling, this, that, and the other. Uh, that might be true. And let's assume it's 100% correct and it's true. But then, if you still live in this environment, then what are you going to do? Okay, so the, the, the right thing to do is to actually go challenge it constructively. And, and, and so I always wanted to advocate people to get involved, to be part of society, to be part of community. And so this is why I spent all the time trying to shape the relationships, but partly for the business and partly hopefully that they would set the path correct between the, between the two countries. Um, so talk about the two countries. Um, everybody has said that, there is, and it's true, there's no more important relationship for global all these two that gets along well for the next 20 years. The China rise is a threat to America and it's, it's and, and you know America has now have to spend some time repairing our own domestic agenda. China is focusing very much on global agendas. We now have reverse our role. If we don't understand each other and how this is going to develop, with all the social effect that's happening around it, it's going to go, it will, I'm afraid it go to have very bad consequences. So, and so we, need, we need to have more people help out and, and, and more discussion, more understanding. 100,000 students going to, to, um, China. to, to China. It's a good, it's a good, you know, it's a good start. You know, all the soft power and common understanding needs to be there. Both sides need to do a lot of work. But anyway, so that's that's where my involvement has been, and in, in, in it, and we do a lot of business there. So you know, we we there's a lot of technology business to be done over there. This is a time that uh, we probably should uh, open up this to a discussion. And uh, maybe I will start asking a question. Any one of you can answer it. Uh, for young brown student right now, just having a degree in Chinese literature or something like that, uh, but nevertheless, they are interested in engaging in China, also possibly just culturally or looking for opportunity. How do you advise them to start? I'll, I'll, I'll start, I mean, if I were doing this, um, you're talking about students with literature. Well, it's any general background. Oh, so, so assuming they have some 
basic. experience basic in language. Uh, oh, 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 okay. So, so they are able to get started. Okay, well, like Allison said, I mean, I think the Allison experience is the best. You know, you have to be, you have to go there. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy mm -hmm. now too. I mean, it's 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 so different than 10, 20, 30 yeah, years ago. Exactly. It's the opportunities, and what I think is nice now is the opportunities to go there uh, through any of your passions, like whether your passion is dance or computer technology or journalism or engineering, you can find a way to get to China in it, with that focus too. Whereas before, maybe it was only through language or only through business. Um, now, you know, if you like soccer, go find yeah. a soccer team in China and go that way. And I think that uh, it, to speak to um, John's point about about the connections and cross-cultural understanding, there are ways to, to, you know, just follow your own passion through China, too. The only other thing I might add to that that makes complete sense, you have to go. I mean, there's actually no great book, there's no one answer, <laughs> there's no one article. You have to talk to people, and the only way you're going to do that is by going there. But then there's a chicken-egg problem when if someone, let's say, they don't have the money themselves just to, you know, do a nice trip, and they need to get a job, the chicken egg problem is, well, I don't have any work experience in China, and of course, a lot of the companies in China don't want to necessarily hire you, even if it's a Western-backed or venture-backed company, unless you have some China experience. So how do you get over this chicken egg problem? So one of the things that um, I've had fun doing the last couple of years, probably done six or seven years now for Brown, is not a lot of internships, but a couple of summer, maybe three, and uh, now Brown financially supports it, so that the air ticket's covered, and there's some stipend. But then it's easy for the company because it's uh, they pay the housing. It's not a big check for them to write. But then finally you can solve the chicken egg problem because then you've got something that you can point to on the CV. And then you also, for the student, they'll get a sense, do I like this? You know, is this clicking for me? Is this something I really want to follow up on? Otherwise it's just such, that first step can be so, so hard. So you know that a lot of the universities start to recognize. You know, if you want people to be more international, international understanding, you, you've got to set a framework so it makes it a little bit easier for that first step. Once you've done the first step, I think the second and third, if you like it, is easier. That first one, but there are now some practical things that make it easier. Absolutely, absolutely, and the resources at Brown, uh, they're there. You just have to find them. My CNN internship mm -hmm. was paid for by a fellowship yeah, at Brown, wonderful. and and I think they're probably even more now than there were then. So. There's also it's also one other thing. I mean, uh, now this is more of a a, a, a life thing. Um, if you just graduate from Brown, you have not a lot to lose. You know, uh, you know, it's like it's like my my dream of getting my PhD. I, mean, I got I do have a list of honorary PhD degrees, but none of them I actually earned, uh, <laughs> which is the easiest way. I had to study nothing to, to get this thing. But um, but but on the other hand, I you know I have to tell you, once you are established in some forms and you have some obligations, it's it's actually been it gets harder and harder and much harder. So so this is something that. You know, like the professor asked, it's a dream or something. I, I just do it now. And so what if it didn't work out? It didn't work out, you come back. I mean, it would say, now the other thing is, it doesn't have to be China, China. It could be anywhere, you know, it could be in Taiwan, it could be in Hong Kong, I mean, I, it depends on where you came from. It even could be in Korea, in Japan, or in Singapore, because if you go out and look at the business world out there, there is not one of those names that I mentioned to you doesn't have a strong China trade. Yeah. In, in fact, just like Drew said, United States has no more than 3% of the Chinese overseas investment. This is a different issue because we don't make, the, one other thing that I've been working on in Washington is how to open up a investment treaty, a bilateral investment treaty of both sides because they don't let us invest as much and we don't let them invest as much. We're kind of in that, in that gridlock here. Um, but, but anyway, I, I would think that other areas, like you know, if you're in Singapore, Singapore, you know, Prime Minister has a strong trade agenda with China. <laughs> if you're from Singapore, there's nothing wrong to be in Singapore. You could work for one of the banks, you could work for one of the, wherever, and they, they'll probably send you over there before you know it. Mm -hmm. And so those are uh, other avenues to go that are more comfortable than just say, okay, I show in Shanghai with two back. By the way, don't show in Shanghai because you can't afford it. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, that's a different issue. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, my, you got my point. Yes. Yeah, I actually have a reverse question. So for students like me coming from China and studying in Brown, um, I see a paradox that 
China seems to have more opportunity right now. But in America, I love the learning experience here and the resources here, and also the high technology and also the humanity, like the rich humanity education. So, where do you, do you guys have like any um, perspective or advice on how can I most benefit from those two education and background? And uh, where should I, like, where's my niche? So I have a bias on it, so I'll just share one perspective. Since you're here, I think it's very useful, and you probably long term, I'm guessing, you know, may have an agenda to go back. If, to get your professional formation, you know, if there's an opportunity to do it in a more developed environment, then you can have that professional formation so that you've got a very good toolkit and also a sense of professional values, whatever they might be. So that when you go back, you can bring that to the table. I think you're going to find it a lot easier. What's challenging, I find, when sometimes we'll send people over that don't have the professional formation or their values in place, and because management talent is so scarce and things are going so quickly, you may have a very random experience. It could be random good, could be random bad. So that's the only, if you can do it, that would be my positive bias. And then and what I've observed that people that do do that, and then they go back, I find that they have a lot easier time as well. But having said that, I wouldn't make that, you, know, you have to be open-minded about it. As it depends on what kind of experience that you'd, you'd have. But if you, could, if you could have it, I would probably opt for that. Well, it could be an advanced degree. It could be some type of work experience. And I think I told this story earlier today, but I remember I was a Brown intern uh, at the council at um, the Alliance uh, Council in Washington, across from the White House. And I was thought I would be interested in foreign policy one day. And I was trying to decide: do I go left? Do I go right? So there's the former Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, this you know, four-star general, Cold War guy, and I got the courage up to ask for a meeting to go just spend 15 minutes with him. And I explained to him about left and right, and he just kind of looked at me. It took me years to figure out what he meant, but he said, son, I think you need to get out in the field and reconnoiter a little. I said, what is he talking about? It took me about a year to figure it out. But what he meant was you need to go try something, you know, see if you like it because I don't think you can know a priori necessarily. And then based on that, <clears throat> the decision could be easier. Do you eventually want to go back? Uh, I want to study here. I want to at least stay here for a longer time. And I feel like I'm still in a high learning curve right now. <clears throat> so eventually, I have a gut feeling that I can add more value to the Chinese or Asian community more, but it really depends on what will happen at that time. I don't want to do myself. What, what area of study? Um, right now, actually I'm doing both dancing as an extracurricular for dancing and also uh, CS. My so my passion is in innovation technology and also maybe a little bit of humanity. And I did uh, science and technology policy research mm -hmm. last summer <coughs> as a professor here. Had a collaboration with Tsinghua University. And also I work for a I, 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 let me give you the, um, uh, the environment, maybe that's, that's, that's the way to say it, and I don't know about the field specifically. Um, recently, um, you know, you guys all heard about, I hope you, I don't know how many people heard of Blackstone, <laughs> um, a private equity firms and, and so forth, and they obviously are, are, are doing a lot of work in, in China, um, or at least try to do a lot of work in China. Um, and they were amazed, the applicants, applications of, you know, job application, the, the people, the kind of caliber of people. These are all people who actually graduate from Tsinghua University and get their advanced degree from MIT or Harvard or anything, and then go, going back. And the most important thing is from them is about being able to read and write Chinese. Mm. Um, uh, this is only one field. It, it, we're talking about investment banking or, or private equity. So, so this is only one field. But that could, you could translate to, you know, it's extremely, extremely competitive over there in terms of talents. And the talents are actually just like yourself, across. Meaning you have the background here and you have the background there. And so you just have to prepare yourself to, to you know, the uniqueness of the past, which everybody who came out and, and been in the United States and go back there 
seems to have a higher consideration or better consideration. That uniqueness is is is, is kind of going away day by day. And and I'm, I just want to share that with you, not to discourage you of any sort. So you just have to put that in part of your equation. How do you how you what are you going to decide what you do or when you're going to do this? My view is. Um, if you ever going to decide to go back, it's probably better to go back earlier than later. I mean, obviously, you have to feel like you prepare. Um, but the opportunity in the United States are also tremendous. I mean, this is so. Like in my, I mean, jokingly saying, in my case, I actually don't want to go back. I like doing business over there. Kind of like I like to visit Shanghai. I would never live there myself, <laughs> in spite of my parents in China. But because there's a different, it's a different culture, it's a different lifestyle. It's a different. It, it, people love it. There are a lot of people love it. I have a lot of foreign friends, you know, a Caucasian friends that absolutely love it, and they, you know, they do it all the time. They do, you know, they have places over there and so forth. But, but back in those days, they could could buy places. But, yeah. uh, but, and, and I, 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 but, you know, I myself, I find America a lot more. Um, suitable for me. Maybe that's the way that I, I like. I like it better out here. But that's individual thing. You have to first decide that, and then you can make, you can make a decision. And also know you can change your mind. I mean, the I think I think I remember ten years ago when I graduated. I felt a lot of pressure for everything to happen right away, and and. Um, I guess what comes with time is knowing you can have it all, but not all at once necessarily. And so knowing what you want and, and knowing that you have such diverse interests, I, I'm an and person, not an or. I like to find ways to combine and make sure I can have it all as opposed to Xing things out. But sometimes I have to know I can't have them all at the same time. And that there's, you know, if you want to try things out here for now, knowing that the whether or not you go back later, maybe you can make that decision later. Um, but try, you know see where it goes and the, the fortunate accidents you know might lead you to Australia or Brazil. <laughs> I have a question for John. I'm, I'm interested uh, maybe what people think about another question. You talked about John the importance of shaping policy and we've definitely found that some of our portfolio companies you the CEO really has to get involved in trying to talk to the regulators, the research institutes that influence the regulators to shape policy. But I'd be very interested to hear what you found to be an effective approach to that. Um, I, <laughs> okay, well, if you talk about a industry per se, um, then you do really need to have a industry group mm -hmm. um, that represent the common interest of the industry group that goes to see the lawmakers. Mm -hmm. The administrator is actually easier. The White House and the State Department is actually easier mm -hmm. uh, to shape. It, it, the, the harder people uh, say because they reflect, they always like to reflect the, the wishes of the American public because of the votes. Mm -hmm. So you have to shape the congressional and the senatorial people. Mm -hmm. All the republic, I mean, all the House and, and, and the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, and they also have subcommittee and so committee chairs that you need to get get comfortable with and go 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 help them shape it. So those are the more important thing. Um, uh, you obviously could join a lot of the think tank, or at least support the think tank to uh, commission them to study. Um, by in the case of private equity, the number one thing right now is they need to make sure that they address the whole taxation issues, mm -hmm. and in terms of what consider as as income short term versus long term, as well as what are the foreign filing requirements of our assets, and so example, right? Or the valuation of that. So this is like the number one issue on the table with the investment community. Mm -hmm. and, and given the whole Neil Obama thinking about the tax law and so forth, that actually could cripple the industry here, mm -hmm. investing overseas. No, I mean, what is gonna do with the way it is being speculated? Probably not. Compromises, always be there. Um, so that that's... And on the China side, yeah. how have you tried to shape policy on the China side? That's, that's a lot more difficult. Um, yes. and, 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 and I think from that side, you got to have to know the ministry people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in the case of probably for any business from the United States, going to have to be MOFCOM, mm -hmm. the Ministry of Finance and, and Commerce. And um, 
you just have to go make sure that you present to them, you join the groups like U.S. Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. and make sure you all, you know, the industry needs and thoughts are reflected into that. Um, and you also could have the industry group, and I keep saying industry group because individual is going to be very difficult sure. unless you are the number one firm in your field. Right? Um, so the industry groups could go see the people like the Gary Locke, who's the ambassador mm -hmm. of, of, um, of the United States to, at, at, in China. Uh, or you could talk to the USTR people, the trade representatives, uh, or the, all the Secretary of Commerce, you know, who goes to do something called the JCCT. So there are process to reflect policy, mm -hmm. you know. Now, I'll give you one example, because so this is a, this, these works, right? And what I'm saying is not like, well, it sounded very big or whatever, but it does work. Um, but about, I don't know, eight years ago when Wu Yi was the vice premier, um, China created this whole idea of having security protocol that are different from the rest of the world. Now, what does that all mean? Well, if that happened and they implemented it, then Cisco routers would not work, period. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now the Cisco obviously wouldn't like that. Uh, Huawei would love it, but you know, right. Cisco wouldn't <laughs> like it. And so, and, and, and also, if you go do that, it, it, let's suppose you adopt that protocol and you don't mind losing time to market window, uh, you still have an issue of sharing technology. Because now, the Chinese, through the new protocol, could actually reverse engineering of what you actually have in your code. So this is a bigger issue than just saying, hey, you know, I'm not gonna do this market. I'm not gonna be in this market. So now, so when Wu Yi came, a number of, of organizations, including myself, so I mean, I've spoken to her, and the JCCT, turns out there is a, called the Joint Commerce, whatever, Task Force, something like, whatever, JCCT, they, the, the Task Force reflected these administration people, government administration people, mm -hmm. reflected that to Wu Yi and his and her staff. And when Wu Yi actually came visited the uh, United States, she got up that day and said, okay, we're gonna put down a hole. Now the Chinese thing is this, you know, put down a hole, <laughs> the Americans always cheers and thought it was a victory. You know, I always thought that this is like, okay, I'm gonna fight this battle some other day. Exactly. Okay, <laughs> put it on hold meaning that no, it's not gonna go away, exactly. you know, anytime, Anytime you offended me or something that I don't like about you, I'll bring it up again, uh, and then we're gonna have that conversation all over again. Um, and, but that's a, you know, there are other ways on a long term to address these things. But but those are the you you have to do it, um, and you have to do it at that level. I have a really small scale example actually about policy because my former boss, um, uh, it was. Um, the executive director of the Beijing Modern Dance Company, but over the course of 10 years, he got them to change a policy to allow arts and culture organizations to register as right, non-for-profits. Yeah. And, um, and before that, if you were an arts and Very culture organization, you were either a government entity or you could register mm -hmm. as a commercial enterprise, a yuxian and, uh, and his, the sort of the story he tells is about how, uh, I mean, it's risk averse, so you have to give, um, you have to make sure that whoever makes a large decision, if it goes wrong, the blame doesn't fall on that policymaker, it falls on the example. And so the way he ended up finally kind of sealing the deal was allowing the Beijing Modern Dance Company to be the kind of test example to register under the Min Bu, under the Ministry of Civil Affairs as the first nonprofit arts organization. And then if they failed, the failure was on that organization, not on the policy people. And then once they succeeded, then it's sort of like you have to see it to believe it kind of market. And so once there was a successful example, then it was safe. It, you know, it, it reduced all the risk for them the mm -hmm. next step. And so, I mean, that's such a small scale example, but I think in terms of, um, you know, man risk management and fine, and who knows if that's applicable on a, on a larger scale. But, but it, won't work, scale. it won't work for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason it won't work for you is if it fails, that you can't get the money out. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, they just stop There's dancing. That's right. Right. <laughs> it, and they leave. Uh, I mean, seriously, I'm not making. Right, I'm sure. not making. Right, sure. uh, this is not right. a. You know, it may sound funny, but mm -hmm. your your assets. Right. Sure. Well, there's a different it's, it's, level of right, capital well, involved. Right. Yeah. It'll be a, it'll be a different mm -hmm. issue. In those policies. Uh, but right. it it does work in category pioneering. Mm -hmm. That is up above table. Mm -hmm. That does work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the downside is you take the risk. Right. 
Understood. Well, and this was all within China. This had nothing to do with foreign organizations, okay. which I think leaves another level of complication when yeah. it's dealing with international trade. Or, yeah. Okay. I have a question. Uh, talking about the you know shaping policy, you know, there's so much you know, involving policy um, when you do business with China. Um, how do you? Is everything really predetermined? Because you know, I, you know, I'm Chinese, but I sort of left China over 20 years ago. I'm on the physics faculty now, so I, I'm never interested in getting into politics. But it's just astonishing to me. Like everybody's talking about Xi Jinping be the next whatever president of China. Is that really being officially determined, announced? And why is everybody talking with that certainty? I heard people talking about it back in November, mm -hmm. and. So is that really official? I mean, is this just something they determine, and then everybody has to know their policy, and then sort of work around? Uh, yeah, um, ninety-eight percent, ninety-nine percent is is him. <laughs> How about the premier? Uh, yeah, no, we we'll talk about premier a little later. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, ninety-nine percent is him, um, and, if, and if it's not him. Uh, the Communist Party, the Central Party, the CPC will probably stop his visit, not only to the United States, which is very high profile, but to everywhere else because he had gone to a number of country visits uh, in the last six months. Partly is a test, a test of how foreign country power people responds to his visit. <clears throat> and and how that matches what the Chinese national nationalisms needs to be shaped. It, 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 uh, it, so the answer is everything predetermined, not to not predetermined to who is the next person, but categorically who might be the next the characteristic of the person they want to pick and the social background that they would like to pick. Uh, that job spec is determined based on a number of years of the number of the five-year plans, which is probably ten, succession of that, and and the current and that dead time situations. So there were, I mean, this is written. I mean, I'm not saying anything out of school here, but because it's written very, you know, there between the premier potential premier choice of Li Keqiang and Xi Jinping. Um, when they say if the president, president and the other one is premier, they are all from different backgrounds. Oh, and and one, one is called from the princeling background, uh, which is Xi Jinping, and the other one kind of move up the ranks from more and more of a central party school background. So, and, and that address the needs of the country, kind of like we're gonna, you know, if our country emulates this, you know, maybe not 100% correctly, you will have, we will have a, you know, if we have a democratic president, we'll have a Republican vice president, and and they will collectively rule that, and then there was a, you know, an, an the other seven members of the state council that are represent different level, different society, different part of the society, and and that make up determine how they want to move China forward. And that's where the state policy planning is so important. And, and, and it's arguable whether that versus the democratic systems, which one is working better. In today's world, it looks like the American system doesn't work as well. <laughs> <laughs> but we won't know. We wouldn't know, right? I mean, you guys are better equipped to tell me that, whoever is on Pauli's side, because you have to study this from, you know, literally from a very long history range of history rather than just a, a period of 10 years. 10 years is not anything, um, or 20 years for that matter. Um, but the answer is it, it, it's determined in spec, not determined in person. But it's him. <laughs> question then? Yeah, I have a question for all three of you. Just real brief answers maybe so we can get a perspective from each of you. But from your organization's viewpoint, is there anything that you'd like to be doing with Brown University to help foster uh, intercultural relations between China and Brown and through Brown, the larger nation of the United States? I would say I had good fortune to talk to um, my old professors at the 
Harvard Business School yesterday, and in, in the last couple of years being involved with Ruth Simmons, uh, President Simmons' uh, China Advisory Council. Kind of the, the one I thought that's come out of that is there's, again, the theme of information asymmetry. You know, you have Jay here's a perfect example. Of, uh, he had the benefit of China coming here, studying here. He knows a lot about the U.S. And there's a whole group of these students, and a lot of them have gone back to China. So in China, they know a lot about us. But as John pointed out, 100,000 strong, that's a good start. But my own experience, and I could just give one data point, I met with probably 40 endowments in the last six months. Only two of them, and these are very well resourced, they should have access to the best knowledge, ideas, people. Only two of them had an investment professional who really understands China or was Chinese. So that's just one little microcosm of the problem. So how does one change that? And one interesting idea I heard was would it be possible and, uh, to have something almost like the equivalent of the Rhodes Scholarship, where you'd get the best and the brightest, it doesn't have to be a big number, that get this opportunity to go to China. And the importance of that is not the 20 or 30 or 50, it's that then it would be a bellwether for all kinds of talented students to say, gee, I see these role models, I want to be like them. I think that's the magnitude of the problem, because if it is the single most important bilateral relationship, uh, it's a problem if, if at all levels, just look at Congress, that's another microcosm of their understanding of China. Uh, we, we have to have a more um, creative or perhaps more bold approach. 100 Down Strong is a great thing. Well, I, you know, a couple of little interns with Brown to bring them over, that's a drop in the bucket, but it's a start. But I'm almost thinking that some institution has to provide some leadership to get a national level visibility and prestige so the really smart, talented people you know, don't have to have a series of virtuous accidents to get involved with China. Hopefully it's then, and I think that's kind of the scale. I always call it also, I've talked about with Matt, uh, Professor Gutman about it, and uh, the idea of a generational strategy. You're not going to solve this overnight. If you have the expectation that, look, it's on my to-do list, okay, I got to it, it's done, next. Sorry. <laughs> this is going to take a generation. So you almost have to take a generational strategy and set that expectation. It's going to take time. It's going to be hard. It's going to require leadership. And so those are kind of my two thoughts from the whole thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the the scale, I think, is because you always have to think scale when you think China. And so... Um, I think initiatives like the Year of China at Brown, uh, in terms of linking it with Brown, is a terrific way to start to educate this community um, and just get a, a greater awareness of, of uh, familiarity with a country and a culture that is playing such a key role. I mean, your comment about the, the Congress, uh, there have been some delegations that have come through with the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations that takes trips through, and it's a little horrifying sometimes to have conversations with these folks who go back and help write policy of just how ignorant they are about um, China and what's going on and, and how the society works. So. Um, I know there's, you know, a Brown Alumni Network in China that's not particularly, I, they do some good work, but they're not as active as they could be, and so if there are ways to link it a little more closely from the smallest scale thing to internships to something larger that can make real institutional leadership um, with building, I'm, I'm sure Brown has partnerships with institutions like Tsinghua and Beida and things like that, but what, what are uh, cross-sector ways that those can, um, you know, develop and, and you know. I think we need a joint degree. Um, I, I, I think we need to have a, either a business or entrepreneur degree, and I do not know whether this should come out of the Watson Institute or other departments. But it needs to be a joint degree that you study two years in Tsinghua or, mm -hmm. or the equivalent school of that, so Jiao Da, mm -hmm. or one of those top universities over there, and you study two years in, um, in, 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 at Brown. Uh, and uh, and y you need to do that because I need to help place the people over there, the graduates. If you don't do that, it will just be, you know, constant conversation about, okay, I graduated from this, and what I'm what am I going to do? And then, and if you uh, in 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 this university system, because I you know because of my involvement once, and I I know, you know, even <laughs> the early days of how we get the university to accept the status of Watson mm. and the definition of that, you know, is a hell of a lot more complicated so like, well, like you're dealing with the federal government. <laughs> uh, I, I got it and I'm not going to name names. I, I, I knew all the people that involved involved. So I, you guys know this a lot better than I do, right? 
So we need that level of commitment uh, before, because I could say this to you, if Brown's not doing it, everybody else is doing it. Okay, and this is the way Brown needs to make that commitment, whether we are going to do it or we're not going to do it, you know. The, uh, you know, that's that's about it. I mean, you have to talk to the board and trustee the Browns and, you know, and, and they have to make sure they allocate funds or raise money for it because otherwise it, it, it does, it, all these conversations will be a lot more frustrating as time progresses when this whole 100,000 strong actually happened and Brown has very little involvement with any of those. This is, okay, uh, I'm, uh, okay, yeah, we have. have Take a break and uh, 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 the other programming style at 4 o'clock. So okay. I just have one quick question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm considering financing technology, but still so quite unsure. Uh, obviously, you all are very well established now, but if you were given the choice to do anything you wanted to do, uh, to go back to ground and do whatever you wanted to do, what different things would you have done? And would you have chosen a different path? <laughs> I'd say no. I got some good advice before I went to Brown. Someone, because I thought I was going to do finance after the Navy, and I said, well, i got to study economics. I said, no, you don't need to do that. It was a very eminent uh, financier. He said, you should do whatever you love and do it extremely well. And if you do something you love and do it extremely well, don't worry about the rest. You'll figure out that business school stuff later. And I was so liberating. It was probably the best advice I ever got. So when I loved history, um, I was even able to convince my dad to let me do it, and uh, I absolutely loved it. And when he saw uh, how well I did at it, etc., that you know it all fell into place. And actually, I think it was very valuable the way I analyzed things uh, going forward. So I think you should find something that you love and do it. And so that I feel good about that decision. Mm. Studio engineer, I like it. That's still your compliment. Okay. All right. Thank you. Quick break.